Well, I also want to add my two cents worth and just say happy Easter to you as well as all of our guests who are with us, perhaps for the first time at the branch. We are really, really grateful that you would trust us with a few moments of your time this weekend. We hope and pray that you sense God's presence among us right now. And a big shout out to all my peeps over at the Farmer's Branch campus who are watching the flat version of Chris right now. Uh, hopefully the sermon in this flat as I am on the screen. But I'm with the Vista Ridge campus in person because they need more help than all of you at the Farmer's Branch campus. They're not as spiritual as you are, and I had to give them some attention this Easter uh, but I'm so grateful that everyone is here. Several years ago, my wife and I spent some time in the Holy Land just prior to Easter. And if anybody's ever been to the Middle East and ever been to the Holy Land, you know it can really add some color to what it is that you read in the black and white of Scripture. I think about our trip, about every Easter. And I also think about a fella who was taking a trip to the Holy Land with his wife and his mother-in-law and while they were in the Holy Land, his mother-in-law suddenly and tragically passed away. And all of a sudden, they were stuck wondering, what do we do? Now, his mother-in-law was a devout believer. There's no place on earth she would rather pass away than probably the land where Jesus once walked the face of the earth. And yet, they were wondering, what, how do we get her back to the States? And they got to exploring that and found out it's quite expensive to transport somebody who's deceased in another country back to the States. And some representatives there in Israel said, believe it or not, we have a provision for tourists who travel here, that, that pass away here, that are on pilgrimages and she can be buried here for about half the price of what it would cost to ship her back to the States. And the guy said, well, that's okay. We'll, we'll go ahead and still get her back to the States. And they go, but sir, what could be better than being buried in the Holy Land at like half price? What could be better than that? He said, you don't seem to understand. I know of somebody who was once resurrected in this land, and I can't afford to take that chance again. But I think we all know that the resurrection has more to do with a person than even geography. And hopefully, by the end of our time together, you can have a little better sense of what in the world his resurrection even has to do with you and with me. Kevin Briggs is a former California Highway Patrol officer, and he's developed quite a specialty you could say that his office is the Golden Gate Bridge. For years, he has specialized in stopping people from committing suicide there. So when he would see somebody who looked like they were thinking about taking their life, he would saunter up to them rather nonchalantly and start a conversation as though he was acting like he didn't know what it was they were doing. He would ask them what they were up to, and of course they would usually lie to him. And then he would go on to ask them, well, what are your plans for the rest of the week? just trying to get them to think about living beyond the present day. And if they didn't have any plans, he would attempt to make plans with them and in fact ask them to meet him back on the bridge the very next day for coffee and bagels that he would provide. The picture you're looking at right now is of Kevin Briggs with a man by the name of Kevin Berthia who was standing on the Golden Gate Bridge. He spent one hour trying to convince Kevin Berthia to step onto the other side of the railing. And Briggs succeeded. Berthia went on to marry and have multiple children. And 10 years later, Berthia met Briggs back on that spot at the bridge to say thank you. Briggs is credited with having saved more than 200 lives in his time with the California Highway Patrol there on the Golden Gate Bridge. He's been given the nickname Guardian of the Golden Gates. And this man, Kevin Briggs, just has a knack for interrupting people's lives at their worst moments. And the chances are there are a few of us in this 
hearing right now in this room and in other rooms, there are at least a few of us who identify with the first picture of Kevin Berthia. We identify with that picture of someone who is in the worst moment of their life. And if that's you, I hope our time together for the next few moments in many ways will be an interruption to you, that it will cause you to step back from the proverbial edge, whatever that edge may be. I've got a friend named Dr. Richard Beck. He chairs the psychology department at a university. He was once asked to give a commencement speech at his son's graduation. He went on to give what he admitted to be the worst commencement speech in human history, by his own estimation. It wasn't his delivery, it was his content. He didn't come with the traditional follow your dreams advice because he's in the field of psychology and he knows what the research and data reveals about the follow your dreams advice. It's not the best counsel for a couple of reasons. One reason is the research reveals that you don't really know what will make you happy. There are plenty of people who've been surveyed, and the data has revealed people who've achieved what they set out to achieve, who got to live out their dream, and it didn't do for them what they thought it would do for them. And then there are other people who never got to live out their dream or experience their dream. They got derailed for one reason or another, and they were disappointed. Few people win at every area in life all the time. The reality is we get fired from jobs, marriages fall apart, the economy changes, you get a surprise in your blood work, you get a phone call that you weren't expecting, and the accident changes your life, the accident changes your plans. To put it another way, the follow your dream advice may not be the best advice because even if you do get to live your dream, the chances are it won't do for you what you think it will do for you. And if you don't ever get to live your dream, you'll just be perpetually frustrated and deceived by the illusion that the reason you're not happy is because you never got to live your dream. Some commencement speech, huh? The ultimate downer, if you ask me. And on Easter, I'm sharing it with you. And yet, it may be the most helpful piece of advice you could ever give a graduating senior because the point that he got eventually got to was framed not in a statement, but in a question. And the question is this, how are you going to face the worst day of your life? What will get you through the lowest moments? How will you deal with your darkest moments? And that's a great question, not just to ask anybody who's graduating. It's a great question to ask any of us as adults because as the great fighter Mike Tyson once put it, and as Jake Paul will find out when he fights 57-year-old Tyson this July at Cowboys Stadium, everybody's got a plan till they get punched in the face. <laughs> but long before Iron Mike said it, Jesus said it. He put it this way in John 16 and 33. He said, in this world, you will have trouble. No one is exempt from this promise. Not even his closest disciples. All of us will have trouble. There will be trouble that we get ourselves into through our own decisions and actions. And then there will be trouble that others get us into by their own decisions and actions. And yet Jesus also sandwiches this promise of in this world you will have trouble in between a couple of other great promises. Zoom out and just look at the whole verse of John 16, 33. He says, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. How are you gonna face the worst day of your life? What will get you through your lowest point and your darkest moment? Jesus affirms three very powerful things here. The first is this. He wants us to have peace. I have told you these things, and he tells you the reason, so that in me you may have peace. His motive is to bring you and me peace. In Luke chapter 2, when he's born, the angels declare this, that a peace is a primary reason he's born into the world. And when he returns From the grave, in John chapter 20, the first words he tells his disciples are these, peace be with you. From first to last in Jesus' life 
on earth in the body of that carpenter from Nazareth, he has a motive to bring peace. And this is true even when he tells you some hard things in his teaching. It's true even when he calls us to do some hard things. In his heart of hearts, he longs to bring peace. There's a second thing he says and affirms, and it's this. Peace is found in him. Note those words, so that in me you may have peace. Peace is located in him. Now, a lot of us grew up with the language of inviting Jesus into your heart. And I don't want to be heard belittling that language. The reality is, our journey with Jesus is not nearly as summed up in as asking him into your heart as it is Jesus calling you into him, to immerse yourself in him. This is really the story that our baptism tells. We're being immersed in him, enveloped in him. We're being swallowed up in him. And when we arise out of those waters of baptism, we're clothed in him. Paul says in Galatians 3 and 27, one of the most practical things this means when you're in Jesus is that when you're in him, you're beginning to look at everything through him because you're inside of him. So you're seeing things through him. You're on the inside looking out. You see things through his eyes and his teaching and his perspective and his wisdom and his values and his gospel. You just look at things differently. And this is one of the ways you find peace that sustains you when you're in a world of trouble. The next time somebody asks you where it is you live, I hope you learn to think, I live in Christ. That's your primary address. That's your location. You live in Christ first before your geographical location. And you can live in peace in the midst of a world in trouble when you're living first in Christ and when you're rooted in Jesus before you're even rooted in the world. How is this possible? This has something to do with what Jesus says next. He says, he's overcome the world. Jesus says, take heart. I've overcome the world. The word you you translate overcome in the Greek is the word from which you get the term Nike. Nike means to overcome. It means to conquer. That's basically what it means. Jesus has Nike'd the world. He's overcome the world. How do we know this? It's interesting that when Jesus says this, he says it in past tense. He says, I have overcome the world. And yet within a few days, it's not going to look like he's overcome the world. He's going to be nailed to a cross. But then again, we're here today, and Easter's on the calendar because we know this wasn't the end of the story. As Bob Goff put it, darkness fell, his friends scattered, death thought it had won, but heaven started counting to three. This is the Easter story. There have been plenty of people down through history who said while they were alive that they would be raised from the dead when they would die. Only one actually was. Everyone else that's ever said it has been crazy at best. Or at worst, just a liar. By the way, this is why whether or not Jesus really was raised from the dead is a really big deal. And becoming convinced in your heart that it really happened is critical. And I'd be happy to share with you some resources to help you think about it more. If you just want to email me, you can contact me through the contact form on the homepage of our website. Jesus talked about rising from the dead so much that if he really didn't, it would make him at best a misguided lunatic or at worst a bald-faced liar. The Apostle Paul realized this in 1 Corinthians 15 and 17 when he said, and if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. If Christ has not been raised, what are we doing here? But if he really was raised, we have to take everything he said seriously. His resurrection is God's way of letting us know once and for all that Jesus is the real deal. Paul would say in Romans 1 and 4, Jesus was declared with power to be the Son of God by his resurrection from the dead. Easter is really about the event in history that happened that tells you who Jesus is. He said he's overcome the world. The resurrection is his exclamation point. 
And that's why I say Easter is first about him before it's about you or before it's about me. But once you establish who he is, now you're ready to pay attention to what he has to say to you and me. And according to him, his overcoming has something to do with our overcoming. He tells us, again, verse 33, take heart, I have overcome the world. The way he lays that out, he's implying, hey, the fact that I've overcome the world has implications for your life. Take heart, some translations say, be brave, be courageous. I have overcome the world. His overcoming means our overcoming. How? Because when you're in him, you're coming along with him for the ride. When you're in him, you're coming along for him, with him for the ride and overcoming. He's taking you with him because you're in him. This doesn't mean we escape the world. Jesus himself had a cross and suffering ahead of him, but the cross and the suffering wouldn't have the last word on him, and it won't have the last word on us who are in him. This is the confession John makes later in 1 John chapter 5, where he says this, everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, verse 4. For everyone born of God overcomes the world. Woo! He just doesn't overcome the world. Everyone born of God overcomes the world. Who is it that overcomes the world? Only the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus doesn't call any of us to overcome the world. That's a really good thing because we can't. What he calls us to is to trust in him that he has. And in his overcoming is our overcoming. And believing that can make all the difference in the world on some of the worst days in your life. Because here's the deal. It's on the worst days of our life that we have the most tendency to be overcome. Sometimes we're overcome by the world within us. And by that, sometimes we're overcome by our sin, our own regret, our own guilt, our own shame. But here's the deal. If Jesus was raised from the dead, then we have to take what he said about his death seriously. And what he said about his death was this in Matthew 26 at that very last supper. He said, this is my blood that will be shed for the forgiveness of sins. Is that really true? How do we know it's really true that his death on the cross really means that? Well, that's what he said in advance and he really came back from the dead. An unoccupied tomb tells you that that was indeed the Son of God that occupied that cross. And that what he said the cross meant, it really means. He did not say on the cross, I am finished. He said on the cross, it is finished, John 19 and 30. One word in the Greek. A word sometimes used in his culture to say that a debt was paid in full. He wouldn't die for only small sins, he'd die for all sins. And there's no wrong that any of us have ever done that's wider than what he has done upon the cross. As Paul put it in Romans 4 and 25, Jesus was given to die for our sins and he was raised from the dead to make us right with God. As he said in Romans 8 and 34, who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus who died, more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Paul said it. Man, if he isn't raised from the dead, our faith is futile and we are still in our sins. But because he's no longer in the tomb, you know what that means? That means you can know that you're no longer in your sin. That's great news. That means this, that when you look to your past, you look to your past for wisdom, you look to past for your testimony, you don't look to your past for your identity. Because you have a new identity. And it's no longer marked by your sins. Your new identity is in him. But you know what? Sometimes we're overcome not by our world within us, sometimes we're overcome by the world around us. We get punched in the face. Our dreams get derailed. The people that you counted on to be there are no longer there. The future you envisioned has no longer come to pass. Makes me think of a couple of disciples on the road outside of Jerusalem on the way to a town called Emmaus in Luke 24. 
They were talking about the events of that weekend 2,000 years ago. They didn't know Jesus had been raised from the dead. He came walking up beside them, totally incognito. It was like undercover boss, man. They had no idea who was next to him when he walked up beside them. And they were talking about what had just happened with the crucifixion. And Jesus, in many ways, plays dumb. He comes up and says, hey, what are you guys talking about? And they responded, where have you been? It's only the biggest story that's happened in some time in Jerusalem. We're talking about Jesus of Nazareth. And they go on to tell Jesus what happened to him, which is kind of hilarious. And then they use this epic line. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. I want you to look at those words, we had hoped. There are a few sadder words than that. But we had hoped. You ever use those words? Those words speak of dashed expectations. They speak of shattered dreams. By the end of the conversation that day, they had come to realize that the one who was walking with them was in fact Jesus, and they had come to learn a very important insight that hope is a who more than a what or a when that comes to pass or not in your life. Hope is Jesus. And Jesus is on every road of everyone who's ever said the words, I had hoped. He's on every road of anyone who's ever said those words. Those two on the road to Emmaus had given up hope, but hope didn't give up on them. Hope came looking for them, and hope is looking for you. And if you're right there this weekend, if you're, if you're like, Chris, I am in an I had hoped stretch of my life, you are in the best place. And here's what I would ask, that before you leave today, after the service, we're going to have people available to pray with anyone who's in an I had hoped stretch of their life. And we'd love to pray with you and just ask for God's grace to be upon you that he would help you to see where he is right now in the midst of your I had hoped season. Because hope is alive and his name is Jesus and as long as Jesus is alive, hope is alive for you. He's overcome and because of that you can too. For several years now I've been meeting with a group of pastors most every February. One of those pastors now retired is a fellow named Roger Storms He had a son named Jeremy who contracted AIDS from a blood transfusion when he was five years old. Jeremy became a follower of Jesus. He was a tremendous witness for Jesus in his middle school and early high school years. And they so often prayed for him to be made whole. But Jeremy had complications and passed away at the age of 15. Before he went into his coma, his daddy Roger was with him in the room and he just asked him, trying to make conversation, Jeremy, how you doing? And Jeremy said, okay. And Roger said, no, Jeremy, I don't mean here. I mean here, pointing to his heart. Jeremy brightened up. His eyes opened and he spoke in a voice stronger than he had spoken in for the last few days. And he said, oh, dad, I'm not afraid. His dad said, son, that makes one of us. Roger was so proud of Jeremy at that moment. And it wasn't but minutes later before Jeremy slipped into a coma. Those were his last words. And yet that thought, that brought Roger profound comfort in the midst of his grief. Now I'll tell you something, you wanna raise a kid that has that kind of courage and peace in the face of the biggest obstacle of all, help them to get to know and trust the one who is overcome. It turns out following Jesus is even a lot more important and even of practical relevance than even the advice to follow your dreams. When you know the one who overcomes and you know you are in him, it's amazing what you won't be intimidated by. 
And the one who made the difference for Jeremy is the same one who made the difference for Roger, surviving the worst day of his life. Today, Roger continues to minister to others, going through the worst days of their lives. The testimony of how he got through his own. I've seen that with my own eyes. When my mother, who lived among us, was told by the doctors, you have about 90 days to live, I couldn't believe it because mom was this ball of energy among us. 64 years of age, sweet woman in our church comes up to her. She knows of the prognosis. She says, Sheila, you love to travel. I'll take you anywhere in the world you want to go. I told my mom, mom, you ought to do it. Get gone. Go do it. My mother didn't want to do it. And finally, I just asked her, Mom, this is a sweet woman. She wants to do this for you. Take advantage of it. You love to travel. And my mother, all five foot two, 95 pounds of her at the time, looked up at me in the same kitchen that I ate breakfast in this morning and says to me, Oh, Chris, in less than 90 days, I'm supposed to be summoned before the king of kings. What on earth can I see here that's going to compare to that? I would rather stay here with the people I love, eat some Tex-Mex and guacamole, and just be with my local church in the time that I have. There wasn't a thing about her that was intimidated because she knew the one who had overcome, and she was in him. And when you're in him, you go for the ride with him. Most of you know that Tara and I lived in Florida for a time. I'd never seen alligators in the wild until living here. In our neighborhood in Coppell, we deal with coyotes. But in parts of Florida, you deal with alligators in your neighborhood. You have to look out for your small pets and even small children, believe it or not. I was captivated by a story a little while back of a boy in central Florida who had waded into a pond only to be surprised by an alligator. It attacked him. It got a hold of his legs and started to drag him down. His mother was out there. She grabbed him by his arms, and there was this tug of war that ensued between the mama and the alligator. A bystander saw it, grabbed a weapon out of his garage and shot the alligator until the alligator let go. The boy was taken to the hospital. They saved the kid's life. A few weeks later, a journalist came by to do an article on what happened. The journalist wanted the boy to talk about the scars that the alligator had left on his legs, but all the boy wanted him to do was to see the scars of his mother's fingernails left in his arms from not letting him go It's so perfect. We've all got our scars from the trouble we faced in life. And some of them run really, really deep. Easter, the story of Easter, the true story in the Gospels, points you to the scars where the love of God wouldn't let you go. And they're not on your body. They're on his. And he's risen and overcome. And because of that, you can too, and will by the grace of God. 